What's up, everybody? It's the Alex Leak and Friends NFL Podcast, back for another week. I'm your host, Alex Leak. We got Dustin back on the show. Dustin, good to have you on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And we got a special guest, Chad Brown. Chad, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, happy to be with you guys. Yeah, it's good to have you back on. It's always a great time having you on the show. It's your third time coming on. For those of you that don't know, Chad is a 15-year NFL career uh, as a linebacker with the Steelers, Seahawks, and Patriots, and is now a sports talk radio host in Denver for 104.3 The Fan. Um, let's get into this. I mean, Chad, an incredible divisional round of playoff football. Does that does this weekend stack up there with some of the best playoff football you've seen in a while? I think it, as far as a slate of games, all four games, when you look at them together, it probably is the greatest uh, divisional round in uh, playoff history. You know, every year since 1970, there's been an upset in the divisional round. Uh, this year, we certainly had that. We had three walk-off field goals, and then we got an amazing overtime game, which then has sparked the overtime conversation again. So... Uh, we got lots to talk about from these games, lots to review and think about, not just for championship week in the Super Bowl, but the entire offseason. So I'm not sure if you could want for more from a divisional round than four games of that caliber, uh, you know, teams that are in it, uh, storylines about, you know, all-time great quarterbacks, and then the, the overtime rule, does the NFL change it? Do they not change it? Who likes the sudden death aspect? Who doesn't? So lots of great stuff from this last uh, weekend. Yeah, and I like all the young quarterbacks having such an impact with Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, who's still kind of young. Um, you know, all these young guys, Josh Allen, you know, played a great game as well. It's fun to see this new crop of quarterbacks taking over the game. Yeah, you know, um, I think every league has this, you know, who's going to take over? Who's going to take over for Magic Johnson and, and Larry Bird? Yeah, you know, who's going to take over for Drew Brees and Peyton Manning and Tom Brady? Um, you know, who's going to take over for Aaron Rodgers? Well, you know, you got Patrick Mahomes, who has put together four AFC championships, home AFC championships in a row. So I think <laughs> you can say, you know, the, the, the mantle has been passed pretty effectively to him. And then for a guy like Joe Burrow to come in and be who he's been, particularly after the knee injury, um, you know, it's been tremendous. So, yeah, the league is in very good hands with these young quarterbacks. Absolutely. Let's go to um, the first game. The Bengals shocked the Titans in Nashville. Um, a great game. Came down to the wire. To me, this game came down to this decision early on. I, I was a big fan of Mike Brabel throughout, throughout the season. I thought he was coach of the year. What he was able to do with Derrick Henry going down and still keep, get the one seed. Um, so I thought the Titans could win this with Henry coming back and playing at home. I just thought the Titans were a contender. And I think in the playoffs, decisions are magnified. What did you think of when the Titans scored their first touchdown? If they kicked the extra point, they could have gone up and taken the lead seven to six. And instead they went for two and failed. And the game is tied. I tweeted at the time, I'm a big believer in taking the lead and keeping positive momentum. Do you think that decision may have played a, a role in the outcome of the game? Oh, I think it did. I understand what Mike was trying to do. I think he recognized, you know, with his offense and his overall game plan wasn't to go out and try to score a lot of points. They wanted to win a close game, you know, very Titan style. You know, lean on Derrick Henry, lean on the run game, ask Ryan Tannehill to be efficient, not spectacular, and lean yeah. on their defense. So, with the game plan that he put together to be able to get, you know, a two-point conversion, that would have been huge for them. What was most likely going to be a close game as he was kind of mapping the game out in his head. So I understand the decision, but I hear what you're saying as well. You know, that decision, when it doesn't play out, has ramifications. Has yeah. ramifications for the rest of the play calling. It has ramifications for your sideline and their feeling about the game. You get that two-point conversion, suddenly you guys are riding high. But instead, you score a touchdown, you miss a two-point conversion, and now you, you're a sense you're kind of deflated. So your ability to you know accept the 
risk reward ratio as a coach, you know, that's part of being in, in that uh, arena there. And Mike Vrabel, my former teammate, you know, tremendous respect for Mike, but I think that decision did have ramifications later in that ball game. Again, not just on the scoreboard, but on the psyche of the players on both sides of, of, the, of the field. Yeah, absolutely. And when you go for two and fail, you just scored a touchdown, right? So everyone was jumping around on the sideline. And then when you fail on the two, it's almost like the defense now is jumping around. Like they just made a big impact play. And so it's interesting the way momentum works like that. <clears throat> Dustin, you have a question? Yes. Um, so uh, as we've seen that the Bengals upset the Tennessee Titans, do you think this Bengals team has enough to be able to upset the, the Chiefs and how impressed are you with the Bengals? I think you got to be. Um, you know, their, the explosive nature of their offense um, certainly is very tough for other teams to deal with. Um, you know, they put pressure on your defensive backs in, in ways that some other teams don't because of this, just the pure explosion. It's the, the amount of big plays they have week in and week out. Obviously, teams try to take them, those big plays away, and they just can't do that. You know, Joe Burrow, is, I think, has got a great mindset for it all, great skill set, and the receivers on the outside are just explosive. Um, and they scheme those guys up to take advantage of that. So I'm impressed. I, I don't think they'll have enough to necessarily hang with the Chiefs. You know, a, a big piece of this will be Tyron Matthews. Obviously missed a lot of the game this last weekend with the concussion. We'll see if he's able to get out of concussion protocol and be yeah. able to return. If he's out there on the field, I would feel a little bit, a little bit more comfortable uh, expecting the Chiefs to win. But if he's missing in this game, that could be one of those X factor kind of things where, you know, the explosive nature – of that Bengals offense uh, going against the secondary for the Chiefs, which I don't think is particularly talented. And if they're missing uh, uh, the Honey Badger, that would be a big loss. Are you are you rooting at all for like an old school matchup, like a Bengals 49ers, 90s, late 80s type Super Bowl? You know what? Uh, people always ask me about uh, who do I root for and what do I root for? And it's going to sound a little cliche, but I never root. I don't okay. root. Um, I, I want to. I want my friends, you know, who are now mostly in uh, in the coaching ranks and in the front offices. I want those guys to do well. I want their teams to do well. But I am not sitting on my couch wearing a jersey or wearing a hat, rooting for one <laughs> team over the other. I want to see a great ball game. I want to see some good football. I want to see some, you know, super talented football minds coach the game and call the game and all that. But I am not on my couch. You know, on pins and needles, hoping my team finds a way to win. Nice. I like it. Uh, Alex, I got one more question to ask. Okay, go for it. So, um, Chad, how do you feel about Ryan Tannehill? Do you think that he's a guy who can take Tennessee to the promised land, or should they eventually look somewhere else maybe? I, I think we may have reached the Ryan Tannehill ceiling. And uh, if I'm John Robinson, the GM in Tennessee, and you know, if I'm Mike Vrabel, you know, there's obviously lots of talk about Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson, um, you know, so we'll see what all comes down fr from that. But I would, if I were those guys, I would try to be a player in those sweepstakes if either one of those guys become available because they certainly have a Super Bowl roster, but yeah. the quarterback position, I think is what limits them. If the run game is operating at full capacity for them and Ryan Tannehill has enough skill to do the play action passes and be efficient on third down. But once you ask more of him than that, I think you're asking him to play past his skill level and that's when errors and mistakes start showing up and that kind of stuff can get you beat. Yeah, and those three turnovers were killer in that game. So it's hard to overcome. Turnovers like that get magnified in the playoffs. Um, Going to the 49ers, shocking the Packers in snowy Lambeau. Special teams played a major role in this game, blocking a field goal and a punt. Um, Aaron Rodgers falls to 0-4 in his career versus the 49ers in the playoffs. To me, I looked at it like this. There's so much talk about franchise quarterbacks, star quarterbacks, and offenses. And to me, great teams that go deep in the playoffs – are complete teams on offense, defense, and special teams. And the Niners, in my opinion, outplayed the Packers in two of those three. Do you agree? Oh, I think everyone would, would agree with that. You know, yeah. uh, I, I live in Denver, and the, the, the station where I do my radio show is, is Denver-based, and we talk about the Broncos all the time. 
And I think every Bronco fan thought that the Broncos had the worst special teams in the league until they saw what the Packers rolled out there uh, this weekend. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, the, the, the poor special teams play was the deciding factor in that ball game. And for Matt LaFleur, you know, he's talked about now, maybe I should have play, played more starters on special teams. Well, heck yeah, you should have. You know, um, it's a third of the game. And at some point, to your point, in the playoffs, those kind of coaching decisions get magnified. Those yeah. kind of errors in, in roster building get magnified. You are going to play the best teams, not the best offense, not the best defense, but the best teams in the playoffs. And if they find ways to win two thirds of the three, you know, different segments of the team, chances are they're going to win the game. Yes, you got an MVP quarterback, but for some reason, sometimes in the playoffs, one of your, you know, factors of your team may not show up well, may not play well, may not be uh, up to whatever the opposing coach has drawn up for them. So that's where you need your other offense, defense, special teams to pick up that one segment that's lagging behind. But the Packers, their defense and special teams clearly let them down, and their offense wasn't hitting on all cylinders. Great opening drive, but couldn't sustain it. Went against a very good 49ers defense. And, uh, you know, the special teams, in my opinion, were clearly the factor. And yeah. for them, they've got to look at their roster in the offseason. And when they bring in guys, they have to bring in guys who are position players, of course, but also guys who can excel and be leaders on special teams. And to that point, uh, Aaron Rodgers falling to 0-4 against the Niners in the playoffs and has, you know, Bears fans like to bring up this. He's got the same amount of NFC championships as Rex Grossman. Do you think that Rodgers' failure to get it done in the playoffs throughout his career comes back to affect his legacy at any point? How, how do you see that? Uh, I think there will be maybe not a asterisk or anything, but maybe, you know, kind of a, a ding against his legacy. Yes, to get an MVP trophy as an all-time great, and he will, you know, wear a gold jacket, you know, in the Hall of Fame, uh, but his trophy's got a ding in it. You know, you were talented enough and had talented enough teams around you where you should have won more than one Super Bowl. Yeah. You, 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 you have not had enough to do that, but for whatever reason, in these magnified moments, you could not do the Tom Brady and find ways to get it done. You could not be steady enough, consistent enough, and reliable enough in the most critical moments where you got your team over the hump. Yeah, it's a good answer on that. Uh, go ahead, Dustin. All right. Um, so do you think this is the end of an era in Green Bay for Aaron Rodgers? And would Devontae Adams end up following him? if it was an end of an era and is green Bay in for a rebuild? Wow. Uh, you know, I think if they want to end all the discussion talking about the Packers and get Aaron Rodgers on board as soon as possible, you know, give him a little bit of time to clear his head and then begin some kind of contract negotiations where you give him two years guaranteed money. This was brought up by Mike Florio today on pro football talk. I thought it was a great thing. You know, Aaron Rodgers has talked about, and all of this conversation has been about respect, and he wants to be respected. A lot of ways you show players you respect them is about money. Not that Aaron Rodgers needs more money, but the money would signify respect. We'll give you two more years on your deal. We'll guarantee that money for you. And with the salary cap going up, to offer a quarterback the caliber of Aaron Rodgers, uh, you know, $45 million plus with, you know, what uh, Patrick Mahomes is getting, maybe two years, $100 million guaranteed. Aaron Rodgers is going to bring it on the field. But along with Aaron Rodgers, then you get Devontae Adams because we've seen receivers force their way out of situations that they don't like. And if I'm Devontae Adams and I've got this amazing connection with one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, which Aaron Rodgers is despite his playoff record, then you want me to go deal with Jordan Love or somebody else like that? Heck no. I'm going to go someplace else where I can be with a great quarterback. I'm going to make life difficult for Gutenkoot's the general manager in Green Bay until he gets rid of me. So not only would they be losing Aaron Rodgers, they'd be losing Devontae Adams as well. So if I'm the front office, I'm trying to find a way to make Aaron Rodgers feel very comfortable, feel very respected. And again, I think that's going to involve some kind of money guarantee deal. Yeah, I like that. That's a good point on that. And we'll see if Green Bay can get it done and keep him around for a couple more years. 
That's going to be something to keep an eye on this offseason. Um, now, I think the 49ers are the best coach team in the NFL. I mean, the, the fact that Kyle Shanahan's been able to win with Jimmy Garoppolo at quarterback, some under-the-radar names at running back, and get the most out of that defense, the Niners are just seem very well coached. It's very impressive to me that they've gotten this far. And, uh, you know, very impressive win on Saturday night. Now they're taking a six-game winning streak against the Rams into SoFi Stadium against Sean McVay. Kyle Shanahan seem, seems to kind of have his number. Uh, who do you think wins this NFC Championship game? You know, the Rams really need to get over that hump and finally get past the 49ers. You know, it's very interesting because you got two teams that are kind of built different ways. The Rams are all about the stars. Von Miller, uh, Aaron Donald. OBJ, Cooper Cup, Matt Stafford, you know, they've given up first round picks to get all these guys. They, they've made an effort to, you know, go the star system. Um, and, you know, versus the 49ers, which you're pointing out, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo is certainly highly paid, but no one would say he's a star quarterback. Mm -hmm. You know, he was good when they needed him last week at the end of the ball game. But other than that, it was a very pedestrian, you know, three quarters for him. So, um, the coaching decisions, the coaching factor in this game, I think is going to, to be huge. Uh, I had a chance to do an internship with the 49ers and be around Kyle Shanahan and his staff. Okay. He's a tremendous, tremendous football coach. His mind for creative play calling, his understanding of the concepts, his understanding of what we are trying to accomplish defensively and how to get you out of position all those little things, they start to add up, and it makes it very difficult to play against these guys. Now, to play a team three times in one season, uh, Kyle Shanahan is certainly very creative, but now you've got to be creative on a whole new level. You plan to play your uh, division opponents twice a year, and when you play them the first time, you hold some stuff back so you can have some new wrinkles for them the second time we play them. Now they're going to play them a third time. So Kyle Shanahan is going to have to go super, super deep into the playbook to show the Rams defense, you know, you saw this the first time we played. You saw this the second time we played. Now here's something that looks similar, but it's actually different as well. So those little wrinkles and nuances that are deep in the playbook, if Kyle Shanahan can get his team to run those things effectively, I'd be leaning towards the 49ers. Well, I'm really looking forward to this game. Um, go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, so um, as we've seen, the Rams beat Tom Brady and the Bucks, despite, you know, one of them great Tom Brady comebacks. Um, what was the Tampa Bay defense doing wrong on that final drive? And do you think Matthew Stafford can continue to prove everybody wrong? You know, the, the, uh, the, the Tampa Bay defensive backs, you know, they've been banged up all year. Um, and, you know, I got tremendous respect for, for Todd Bowles. Um, I actually did a coaching internship there when he was with the head coach of the New York Jets. I, nice. I like his system. I like how he thinks about football. But at some point, you know, when you are going against uh, an offense schemed up by Sean McVay and with the talented players out there that the Rams throw out there on offense, it can be difficult for defensive backs who've been banged up all year, have had very little time together, and some guys are out there you know, with big braces on and all that stuff. When you're not 100%, uh, you can be exploited. And, and I think the Rams were able to find the matchups that they like and then create enough confusion and uncertainty for a, a group that hasn't played together a whole lot, um, you know, all season long and exploit that. So Sean McVay is certainly a, a masterful play caller and was able to dial up those right things. And then Matt Stafford, I think is the quarterback that Sean McVay has been hoping to have a guy who can be consistent. You know, they recognize the ceiling in Jared Goff. They went to Matt Stafford because they needed a higher level of consistency in that offense. And that's what he's, you know, brought to them. And this is why they're going to be in the championship game this weekend. Now to that point, uh, going to Niners and Rams, um, I've been very critical of Matthew Stafford throughout this season, at times throwing some bad pick sixes or making some mistakes. He's been great so far in the playoffs. But coming into this NFC Championship game, we got to remember the Niners might not even be in the playoffs if Stafford had handled his business in Week 18. And when he threw 
two bad picks in the fourth quarter that allowed the Niners to get that comeback win and clinch the playoffs. Do you trust Stafford? He's played great in the wild card, played great in the divisional. I could see him making some mistakes in this conference championship round against a team that, that knows him very well. What are your thoughts on that, or am I hating on Stafford? I don't think you're hating on Stafford. I mean, you're, you're looking at football with your eyes, and your eyes are telling you this guy has made these kind of mistakes. But I'm tying this Rams team to Tampa Bay last year. Okay. Uh, I had uh, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, week one last year. Tom Brady was clearly not on the same page with Byron Leftwich and Bruce Arians. It was, a, it, was, it was an ugly game. He threw a pick six, and they struggled, you know, the early part of the season. They got some momentum, but there was a couple of games in there where Tom Brady definitely did not look comfortable and did not look to be with a full grasp of the offense. And I think we've seen some of that from Matt Stafford this year. It's shown up as pick sixes and, and ugly interceptions, but I think it's that same thing of, you know, I, I'm a really good quarterback, but I'm still not – fully comfortable as time has gone on. So Sean McVay has to be careful, I think, with how much he piles onto Matt Stafford's plate, um, you know, recognizing that here's a guy who's got, you know, 85% of the offense down. You know, how much more can I put in the playbook? You know, how deep can I go in the playbook where my guy is going to be comfortable? Um, so if I'm Sean McVay, I may be calling Bruce Arians and be like, what did you guys do with Tom Brady last year that got him that great, that great playoff run you guys went through? because I need the same thing from my guy this year. Yeah, and I think this will be the toughest defensive test in the playoffs so far against this Niners D. So Real quick, yeah. Alex. Huh? Uh, real quick, I had one more question. Okay. Yeah, um, so I know there's a lot of people who don't think that he's a guy who can do it, but in my opinion, I feel like Jimmy G can be a playmaker when he wants to be. How do you feel about him? been able to take the 49ers over the edge to finally hoist the Lombardi? You know, I think Kyle Shanahan has to pick his spots with Jimmy G. Um, if you go into the game plan relying fully, solely on Jimmy G, I think he's going to crush your spirits. But if you get the run game going and you get some, you know, uh, run after catch from uh, the tight end, if you get Debo Samuels going with some of the run game stuff, and you get that defense back on their heels, I think Jimmy G is good enough to execute, you know, four or five critical plays a game. But if you're looking for 20 critical plays a game, 15 critical plays from Jimmy G, I just don't think the decision-making skill is there or the, the sense of timing. That, that throw to Kittle last week was just so late and so ugly. I was like, well, come on, man. You got to <laughs> know better than that. So those are the kind of plays I think Kyle Shanahan is always trying to avoid when he limits what he asked of Jimmy G to do. I like it. Yeah, that's a good answer there. Um, going to the Bucks real quick, there's been a lot of talk after the loss about maybe this is it for Tom Brady. Um, do you think this could be, you know, could be Brady's last year? And what do you think ultimately derailed the Bucks? Do you think the Antonio Brown drama – and losing Chris Godwin had a lot to do with the Bucs, uh, you know, not getting back to the Super Bowl? They were certainly banged up at the receiver position late in the season. Um, I don't think the Antonio Brown drama derailed them because I think they got enough, you know, veteran leaders in that locker room. Yeah. Um, but it certainly hurt, you know, their offense once they had were hit with some injuries. And Antonio Brown is a guy who can put pressure on a defense just purely by the speed on the field alone. Yeah. Uh, so that was an issue. And then, you know, again, those defensive backs were banged up all year along, and they were able to kind of patch together a strong defense despite that. But, again, in the playoffs, injuries are magnified. If guys aren't 100% is magnified. So in the end, uh, the receiver issues, the defensive back issues, I think were just enough to get them that, you know, it was a close game, but that's, you know, three points right there, and that's a loss. Yeah. Yeah, and they had some tackling issues as well. A lot of missed tackles by that secondary. Yes. Again, guys, it's hard to go out and, you know, bang somebody when you're strapped together with braces and everything else and, you know, you're banged up and you're not 100% yourself. Yeah, 100%. Go ahead, Dustin. All right. So, um, 
obviously the Chiefs defeated the Bills in overtime in what, in my opinion, was the game of the year or the game of the year in, in Arrowhead. And Josh Allen really stepped up and showed that he belongs. But what do you think that the Chiefs did wrong in the 13 seconds to blow that final touchdown? And how do you feel about the overtime rule? Do you think both teams should have an opportunity to, to possess the ball and score? All right, so what Leslie Frazier did, the defensive coordinator for the Bills, he protected the sideline. If you look at those clips, all the defensive backs had their backs to the sideline. They were trying to make sure that Kansas City could not, you know, get a sideline route and step out of bounds and stop the clock. So they left the middle of the field open. And for Patrick Mahomes and, and Travis Kelsey, you know, those guys have such a connection. And I think every, you know, real NFL fan has seen the clip of Travis Kelsey talking to Patrick Mahomes about he want, what he wanted to do. That was not the play design. He just recognized what the defense was doing, got in between those guys, and was super efficient. You, yeah. you, know, you, you contrast what the Chiefs were able to do versus what the Cowboys couldn't do a couple of weeks ago, and you know the contrast is stark. Here's a guy, a quarterback, and a tight end who are on the same page. They've gone through the situation before. They know exactly what to do. They know exactly how to execute Travis Kelsey knew exactly how long he could run the ball before he had to go down. It was a perfectly played. Uh, the Bills' defense allowed that to happen. Um, but even in that situation where, you know, they call that same defense, I'm not sure if there could be another set of receivers and quarterbacks other than the Chiefs who could pull that off as efficiently and as competently as they did. It was beautiful to watch. It was situational football at its absolute finest. Yep. Now, to go to the, uh, the overtime question. Um, I'm pretty firm in this one. I feel pretty strong about my feelings. Um, you have a full 60 minutes to win the ball game. Um, and if you want to avoid the overtime and the potential for sudden death, then find a way in the end of a ball game to be aggressive. When you score, go for two. After yeah. you score, go with an onside kick. There's lots of things you can do as a coach to ensure that you are not subjected. You know, I'm using air quotes here with my fingers. I know we're just talking. You can't see me on my fingers. Subjected mm -hmm. to the, you know, sudden death and the fairness of the, uh, the, the coin toss. I think in my mind is, is a ridiculous concept. I understand the folks who are like, oh, I want to see both teams have a chance at it. I don't, I, then, then how do you do that? Do, do somebody scores a touchdown? and then you kick the ball off to them and they have a chance to score a touchdown there. Is that how do we do it? Do we do it like college football where we completely change the structure of a game? You get the ball at the 20 and I get the ball at the 20. So we eliminate kickoff and kickoff return and punt and punt return from the game. It's a team game. I need to see all three phases here in overtime because the, the gameplay should be standard as it is in regular time. So I got some strong feelings about that. I like the overtime rule. If you want to avoid that as a team or as a coach, find a way to win that thing in regulation. Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, this is the number one defense in the NFL, the Buffalo defense. Make a play. Defender Defenses are paid very well to perform in those situations. You, you know, I agree. A lot of people want to see, you know, both offenses on the field. But like we said earlier on, it's a three-phase, three phase three team you know three phase game and you can't just great offenses don't just win you got to make stops too you do you, you you do and so buffalo was let down after a great tremendous performance by by josh allen um who man that guy is just such a problem for defenses obviously he's got a cannon for an arm and when he takes off and runs the ball you know, he runs past people. He runs over people. That is a big dude running the football. So he's going to be a problem for defenses for years to come. But, yeah, that's got to be just so disappointing for the Bills, for Leslie Frazier, for Sean McDermott to, you know, because in that situation, that is the defense that you want to call. You want to take the sideline away from the Chiefs. But, unfortunately, those guys had such a great connection and knew exactly what to do. that They were able to exploit your defense. So, all those coaches who have that, st that standard sideline protection defense, yeah, they're going to be looking at what the Chiefs did and trying to figure out how can we put one more guy in the middle of the field while still protecting the sidelines. Would you have considered squibbing the kick there and taking some time off the clock that way? Yeah, it, it, 
it all depends on you know how good my kicker is at that. You know, yeah. if I had confidence in him that he could squib it, maybe get it over the first line and have that thing bounce, you know, somewhere around the 20 and chew up some clock. Yeah, I suppose I would have done that. Um, so that would have been my number one criteria is can my kicker actually execute this? Because we've all seen squib kicks go bad. Um, yeah. Team score late in the first half and they want to squib it and chew up some time. And it's able to be recovered by that first line of on the kickoff re, uh, return team. They get one first down, they're kicking a field goal. So yep. I know that's what the Bills were trying to avoid. But at this point, the, the, the seconds are so precious. If you're able to take a few seconds off the clock, that would have been the difference in that ball game. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, I've been watching this Chiefs team closely. You know, ever since Patrick Mahomes took over as a starter, it just jumped off the TV screen. It's like, this guy's special, and this offense is special. Um, I was so impressed with what Todd Bowles and the Bucks defense did last year in the Super Bowl to keep the Chiefs from repeating. But this team is firing on all cylinders right now. Um, they look damn near un unbeatable to me. Um, I don't know if the Bengals have the defense to slow this team down. What do you think? I mean, I'm kind of rooting for a Niners-Chiefs rematch because I think the Niners' defense could give them some problems. Do you see anybody really slowing down this Chiefs offense? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think the Niners have a pretty good shot. They got some uh, very talented defensive line group. When I did my internship out there with the Niners, I was working with that defensive line group. They've got a great coach. They've got a great scheme and a great style. Um, and they bring in guys who fit what they want to do, which is just be super aggressive on that defensive line and get after the quarterback at all costs. Um, they may be the only ones who are able to do it. Obviously, the Chiefs, you know, remade their offensive line. They made that a focus in free agency in the draft. Uh, Creed Humphreys, their center, uh, not only is, you know, the highest uh, scoring or ranked center as far as rookie offensive linemen, He's one of the highest ranked offensive linemen all across football, according to Pro Football Focus. So they really did a good job getting the right guys, and that offensive line is, is paying off. And Patrick Mahomes has not been running for his life like he was in that Super Bowl last year. Yeah, absolutely. And, Dustin, I know you're a big fan of the, the midseason acquisition of Melvin Ingram there in Kansas City. Yeah, that was uh, – that seemed to be what, you know, turned the door and made the defense better for the Chiefs. Absolutely. I got to agree with that. I got to agree with that. He, you know, it was not a good fit for him in Pittsburgh. Um, he goes to Kansas City, you know, pairs up with Frank Clark on the other side. They've got some athletic, you know, ends who can beat tackles inside, beat them outside. And those guys are, are going to be a factor here uh, next week. And, you know, I expect the Chiefs to win and also in the Super Bowl as well. Quick nice. question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So what do you think it's going to take to be able to stop Mahomes? Do you think it's – you know, confuse him when it comes to coverage, or is it pressure him? Uh, I think he's got such a great, you know, group of veteran receivers out there that you're going to have a hard time confusing those guys. I, I think the receiver core is smart. You know, some of those routes aren't even really routes. You know, it's it's Travis Kelsey settling down in between his own. It's yeah. how we feel, you know, recognizing that you're shading the safety the other way and instead of running the in route, he takes it to a go route because he knows he's getting, he gets man coverage. And you got Patrick Mahomes, a quarterback who's smart enough and has the arm strength enough to be able to make all those throws. So I think in the end, the only way to really affect him is what Tampa Bay was able to do last year in the Super Bowl, which is have him running for his life. You got to you got to escape the pocket one way or the other, which then you know cuts the field in half defensively. So those kind of things that you can do up front is going to be critical to you know, slowing the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes down. Nice. Good answer on that. Dustin, you got one more? Yeah, so today we seen uh, Sean Payton decided to step away from the New Orleans Saints. Um, are you surprised by this decision? And do we see him in the future, possibly next year? You know, uh, I've been hearing a lot, you know, a lot of people want him in Dallas. Maybe Mike McCarthy, you know, doesn't work out for them. What do you believe? Uh, I think the Saints hold his rights for three more years. Um, so it's hard to imagine them giving that up to the Cowboys without, you know, some significant draft picks uh, to, to make that move happen for them. Um, so I know Jerry Jones is probably in a meeting right now trying to figure mm -hmm. out how to pull it off. 
Uh, <laughs> because I think Sean Payton's a tremendous coach, and you know that seems to be what the Cowboys have been lacking: uh, the ability to kind of have that detail-minded, offensive-minded coach who can really take advantage of those weapons they have offensively. Um, but I, I think Sean Payton is going to step down for you know a year or two. Um, obviously, the the Saints are in salary cap hell. There's 74 million dollars over the cap, so there's going to be some serious cost cutting going up, going on. Uh, they don't have a true answer at the quarterback position. So if I'm Sean Payton, I'm, I'm a little burnt out. You know, I've been thinking about this for a couple of years, but man, I don't have Drew Brees. We don't have a way of going out and getting a quarterback because we got no salary cap space. We're going to have to cut some veterans anyway to make it all just to fit within the salary cap going into the off season. Yeah. It's going to be an ugly year for the saints. So I can see why he stepped away. Um, so that yeah, that'll be something to keep an eye on for sure. And then you do radio in Denver. Um, you probably talk about the Broncos a lot there. What do you think the Broncos are looking to do this off season? And can they upgrade the quarterback position? Maybe Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson, or maybe even someone like Matt Ryan. Uh, you know, I don't think Teddy Bridgewater will be back unless it is just as a uh, wise veteran to help if they go in the draft and take one of these quarterbacks in the draft. Now, this is a poor year for quarterbacks in the draft. So to for the Broncos to draft a quarterback to have the ninth pick in the draft, that would be earlier than any of those quarterbacks are expected to go. Um, I'm sure they could trade down and get one of those guys. But now you got, you're going to have this rookie compete with Drew Locke. You know, do you, so I think the Aaron Rodgers sweepstakes is going to be interesting for them. George Payton, the new general manager, Certainly did a good job in the draft this year. He's got his head down right now trying to figure out who the next coach of the Broncos is going to be. Then I, I'm pretty sure he'll shift his focus to the quarterback position. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting offseason for the Broncos. Um, the AFC West, obviously Patrick Mahomes is going to be there for a long time. They're stacked offensively. Uh, Justin Herbert out in L.A. with the Chargers. They got a good quarterback. Uh, Derek Carr, depending on what happens with the Raiders, um, they're ahead of the Broncos quarterback situation. If you were to bring in Matt Ryan, I would say, you know, most objective football people would say the Broncos would still be fourth in the AFC West as far as quarterback rankings go, even if they went with Matt Ryan. So how do you move the needle to be able to do enough to possibly win this division? That's a super uphill climb because it's the Chiefs at the top of this division. Yeah, absolutely. That's great insight. I'm looking forward to seeing what the Broncos do. But, yeah, it's definitely an uphill climb in a very tough division. Real um, quick. Yeah, one go last, ahead. One last question. Yeah, so who do you think would be a great fit as all these coaches that are available to take over the head coaching spot right there in Denver? You know, uh, everyone you know, has a, a certain dog in the fight. I want an offensive guy because the Broncos' office isn't very good. I want a defensive guy because we've got talent on the defensive side of the ball. We need to make sure that doesn't go away. Uh, I want a young guy because that's what, you know, the Rams have, and that's what the 49ers have. No, I want an old guy, because we went down this road with Josh McDaniels and Vance Joseph, and it didn't work out. Yeah. I don't have a dog in the fight. I just want the best coach who is a really good communicator. I have been around old coaches who are great communicators. I've been around young coaches who, are, who do that. I've been around offensive guys and defensive guys who are able to do that. So as far as what your expertise and specialty is, or when you were born, I don't care. The Broncos mm -hmm. need a detail-oriented guy who's able to do both sides of the football. I think Dan Quinn is still the front runner right now, clearly a defensive-minded guy, but he hired Kyle Shanahan to run his offense in Atlanta. So he certainly you know, knows how to find the right people to get the offense going. So if it's Dan Quinn, I think that would be a great hire at the very least. The Broncos would not be – taking a risk on a coach who could possibly suck. Dan Quinn does not suck as a coach. I think we all can agree upon that. Um, but, you know, how he builds out his staff and who becomes OC, those would be those critical coaching decisions that would determine how long he would get to remain the head coach of the Denver Broncos. Nice. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much for your time, Chad. Um, do you have anything you want to uh, shout out, any work that you're doing? You know, uh, like I said, I'm always, uh, you know, doing my show in uh, Denver on 104.3 The Fan. You can, you know, figure out and find me all my football travels uh, at, at Chad Brown 94 on Twitter. 
I did uh, 14 games this year with Compass Media between the NFL and had some tremendous college football games. So, yeah, it's usually a pretty entertaining follow because I'm always talking about football somewhere, someplace, into microphones and cameras, and usually it's at a pretty good game. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much for your time. It was awesome having you back on the show, talk some playoff football, and thanks for making the time to, to come on the show. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on again. Good stuff as always. You guys have a good one. Take it easy, and let's uh, enjoy some great football this weekend. Absolutely. Thank you, Chad. All right, see ya. Bye-bye. <laughs> yep, later. Thanks, Dustin. Good stuff as always. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and have a great week, guys. Peace out.